Well, welcome everybody, and thank you so much for joining us again for another episode of In the Ladies' Room. Oh, man, what does that title mean? So, uh, this is another session of our Women Lead Online Forums brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. And I'm Patty Vargas, I'll be your, your host today. And like I said, here we are, we're in the ladies' room, and you know it's that place where women talk about things we might not say just anywhere. And things that we can only say to one another because, well, because we've had shared experiences. And this is our opportunity to talk about it, maybe vent some frustrations, give advice to one another, uh, a little bit of free therapy and come away with some new ideas or validation. So you know, I like to say that in the ladies room, we go there. Now our session today lasts for about an hour. And if you've joined with video, you're going to be able to see all of our panelists and our attendees alike. And questions and comments are always welcome. So if you have something you'd like to contribute anonymously, though, just put it in the chat and I'll share it for you. But feel free to, um, to speak up, ask questions, make comments, uh, disagree, whatever. This, everything is, is uh, fair game. Now, our topic today in the ladies' room is gender-based communication differences. Dun, dun, dun. I mean, what could possibly go wrong, right? We're talking about something like that. So, um, and I'm really excited to introduce our special guest today. And I'm going to tell you just a teeny, wit, teeny little bit about them and then let them further introduce themselves when I turn it over to them. So first of all, we have Samara Hakim, and she is the founder and the president of Culture Grit LLC. She's an international culture and inclusion strategist, thought leader, speaker, and writer. And Jen Conkey is the founder of Lead Her Ship coaching, consulting, and business strategy. And this is a business that she started in 2015, 2016, after 22 years of progressive leadership in corporate America. And then Linda Amaro is the CEO of Clarinet Solutions, a SharePoint implementation company, as well as president of the board of directors for Susan G. Komen, San Diego. Now, Here's why I started thinking about this particular topic. Um, number one, I'm, I am a uh, avid reader. I'm a rabid reader, I guess you could say. So I'm always reading, you know, articles in, in HBR or Broadsheet or Fairy God Boss or Huffington Post or, or wherever, you name it. And so I'm, I'm always looking for new ideas in, in, um, especially in gender equality and, and women in leadership and that kind of thing. And, and so I was reading some articles about the differences between the way men and women communicate. And, you know, the interesting thing is if you, if you ask a man to name the top three strengths and weaknesses of female communication, just get ready for a flood of gender bias, stereotypes, assumptions, probably hear the, you know, the same thing over and over again. But the funny thing is, is if you ask a woman for the same list regarding male communication, you're probably going to hear some of the same stereotypical generalities. So how much of it is the truth? And how much of it is just steeped in years and years of experiential mutual disrespect and years and years of microaggression and, you know, saying you're too emotional and stop mansplaining and you know, men and women have to communicate with each other, right? I mean, it, it, that's not ever going to change. So what I wanted to do here today was I wanted to go there. I wanted to talk about, you know, the good, bad, the ugly, and get some of your experiences. What have you seen? What have you done? How's it been handled? Where would you really like to have a do-over maybe? And, and just you know, have the conversation and increase awareness around it. So that's my goal for today. I'm going to stop talking for a minute and let you guys introduce yourselves, say a little bit more about you and what you do and maybe why this topic was interesting to you. So Samara, why don't you, why don't you kick us off? Why don't you give us a start here? Uh, hi everyone again. Uh, so basically I, I, like I said, I do diversity and inclusion and uh, at the heart of that, especially these days, you know, we're talking 
a lot about gender. Uh, but for me, it started a long time ago when I uh, was practicing law. And for those of you who may be familiar with the legal profession, uh, it can be quite notorious uh, for <laughs> sometimes the lack of inclusion. And uh, even though a lot more women are graduating from law school and all the stats uh, show us the effectiveness of women lawyers. So that's how it started. I also worked on family law, working with domestic violence survivors. Um, and from there, uh, you know, nothing gets more pronounced in terms of the gender dynamics and power and control and oppression. Uh, seeing that work. So that is separate from even the personal things that I've been through and not just in my gender, but also adding the other layer of my identity, my ethnicity, my accent, my background. Mm -hmm. uh, that's basically why I'm interested in that. How can we work together effectively, leverage these differences that we have and uh, acknowledge them that they are there, but they're not barriers and obstacles. Nice. Great. Great. Nice. Linda, how about you? Well, I'm a longtime IT uh, individual. I have 25 plus years in IT management, um, spend many years in software development and delivering uh, online applications for tier one companies. They were probably, you know, your larger insurance companies, which could be also considered financial institutions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but the critical nature of their business of having systems up 724, 365, pretty much drove everything we did. Mm -hmm. And uh, the unfortunate part was in the industry from the time I began to even today, there are so few women that are really involved in the leadership uh, capacity of organizations. And I, I find it really a shame because I think the women in some cases are better at problem solving and looking at the detail than the men. And that even could be kind of a generalization of a female trait. Sure. But they just they just seem to have a little bit more wiring. And if you look at the linguistics of a communication and how the brain works, a woman's brain has five to six receptors open at all the same time. So mm -hmm they're collecting all those channels of information where a man has two to three and only one is open at a time. So we can pick up things that they can't. Mm -hmm. And it does cause some issues in the communication and it's part of that gap in um, understanding between the employees and even the management structure uh, yeah. to the employees. Yeah. So I really got in, interested in looking at the gender, but also the complexity within the generations on top of it. Yeah. You, you end up having a much more complex environment. There's five generations in a workforce today, and you add on top of that the differences between uh, the personalities or the stereotypes of the sexes, right? And you yeah. end up having those challenges on top of everything else. Yeah, yeah. All right, Jen, how about you, our NLP practitioner? Yeah. <laughs> sure. So, yeah, I, I, similar to Linda, I came from a corporate background, and I did it in a male-dominated industry, in the automotive industry, for mm -hmm. manufactured airbags. And on top of that, I also did it at the ripe age of 19 years old. So it was 1993, I was 19, and I ended up becoming in a supervisor role. And during that time frame, it was very much an eye-opening awareness moment of, okay, so I had men that are my age now, you know, they're on level 44, 45, and they're, what do you want, little girl? And for me, it was difficult because I was put in this position to lead, and I didn't know how. Yeah. So that was the first thing. Is like back then, it was a disservice that we, we used to put people in leadership positions and not really prepare them. Mm -hmm. So I, I learned a lot of trial and error. And over the years, one of the biggest things that I learned was that um, it's not really, it's not really gender specific in my opinion. Um, and it made me get really, really curious about it. So you can look at so many different studies that indicate really either side of the fence. You know, there's the whole male, male brain, woman brain. And then there's other studies that show you that they've actually looked at other people or looked at a, a cross map of both genders and that 98% of the brains were exactly the same. So, I mean, whatever study you look at, I, unfortunately, that's how statistics are. Is that you, look, you, you can present anything that you want people to see. So, right. um, 
I, I dove into NLP. And the reason why I dove into NLP is because it's, um, it's the neuro-linguistic programming process of identifying how to get in rapport with people. And there are predicate words and phrases and body language that indicate whether you're a man, a monkey, a woman, or a goat, what you prefer to communicate. So it's either a visual communicator, a kinesthetic communicator, auditory or auditory digital. And we all, everybody, regardless of gender, every person in the world interprets the world through a different set of filters. So we see it all through a different lens. Whether you're a man or a woman, it's about your experiences and how you interpret what's happened to you from events that have taken place throughout throughout time, throughout your time on the planet. Okay. So for me, I'm particularly passionate about this subject because for me, gender it, gender is not relevant. And we named our, our company Lead Hership because I was running into so many women that were getting tripped up about gender blocking them. And I wanted to help unblock that for them and then also teach them how to look at the key phrases and predicate words and the body language of the, the no matter what it was, it was a strong personality type, whether it was male or female that they were encountering, they could not influence them. Mm-hmm. So I try to take my clients and teach them, here's how you can influence by understanding and interpreting what their preferred communication style is and then speak to that. And then because, you know, when it comes to rapport, if somebody is like us, we usually like them. Right. So if you demonstrate and step into their world, model their energy and model what their perception is and how they communicate, that nine times out of 10, you're going to get into rapport with them and, and just kind of move all the obstacles out of the way and, and move forward. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. So that's why I got interested in it. Right. Right. So it's interesting that, you know, I, I like what you said about um, that you don't even necessarily see it as a gender thing. There are so many, and actually everything all three of you said just kind of, you know, layered on top of each other. So you take uh, the gender differences and then you add generational differences and then you add in nationalities or um, regional differences or uh, all of those things, you know, begin to impact how well we are actually communicating with one another. And, you know, what what I find so interesting is, and maybe it isn't isn't only within generation or um, uh, gender, but we get locked in on certain words, you know? Like we, uh, something that someone says that's very offensive to me as a woman, or maybe very offensive to me as a middle-aged woman, or maybe very offensive to me as a, the only woman at the table at some company. And, and then we stick a label on it. Well, it's because they are anti-woman or it's because they are, you know, practicing ageism or, or something. So say something about that, you guys, as far as like where we get stuck in labels and words and trigger phrases and things like that. And uh, labels for me, it is, it's a serious label problem. And when you, when you, what you just explained is exactly what it is. So our age, our generation, our culture, uh, where we come from, all of it is a, the experience. And that's how we see the world is through that lens, the lens of our experience. Our gender will more, more often than not cause us to have certain experiences in life. Yeah. And I think that that's where people get tripped up on the gender part of it. Mm-hmm. So for me, I, I think that it's just a matter of, understanding the other person's model of the world. So, you know, what are their generational things? Where did they come from? Where did they grow up? You know, what are, how are their parents? What are they like? And, and I think the biggest thing is like, what motivates them? And what do they want like, and that you might be able to, to provide? Or how can you relieve a pain point for them? But really just understanding them. I think that that's where we tend to get tripped up is uh, taking it personal and it triggers us because of our experience and that baggage that we're carrying around just it slows us down and it causes us to respond in a, in a way that it's more like a reaction versus a response. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, I, I totally agree. I agree. Go ahead. Okay. I, yeah, I was going to say, I agree that there's a focus that we need to have on the individual. Uh, but uh, just like you started, Patty, you know, you said we have uh, shared experiences. So I'm, I'm of the school of thought that generalizations are okay. 
the difference becomes when we stereotype. So when I generalize, it's because there are patterns and systems in place mm -hmm. that are feeding back into whatever differences you might find and groups of people and cohorts. <laughs> but yes, definitely each cohort, you know, as women, we each of us here in, in this room that we are together, each of us come from different experiences. There's all these layers. Yes, the individual is important. However, there are some things that we see out there and uh, not just from studies, uh, you know, thinking about how we socialize little girls and little boys, even using the word woman and how we interpret that. Uh, and usually it's something where we're assigning that gender to someone mm -hmm. from the way they look like as opposed to the gender that they're identifying with. Mm -hmm. So definitely what you said about labels uh, are a problem, but labels are rooted in that stereotyping and being fixed in our perspective. But the generalization piece of things we're saying, odds are that if you are from this place or this is how you grew up, just basically what you're saying, uh, Jennifer, you know, if odds are that that might be your lens of the world. Now, when I'm with you, I'm not gonna just stick to that point. I'm gonna work to talk through all of it with you to see if actually that is in fact your perspective. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I love that Linda talked about the generational thing because for me, and especially in the corporate world and being and coming in as a vendor, it's very interesting uh, to see uh, what age I'm generally assigned uh, separate, you know, from all the other layers of my identity and, and the whole young lady thing right off the bat, uh, you know, while it might seem a term of endearment. Uh, from an uncle or <laughs> from a friend when you're starting a workshop and somebody who's not really into this by the way starts with young lady I mean they just the intention is to discredit uh, what you're trying to say and, and yeah. all that so it's these patterns of how women are perceived uh, that I think are are important regardless of our individual differences there's still so much that we can talk about in terms of what's being prevalent within cultures and subcultures mm -hmm. okay, back to you, Linda. <laughs> yeah well yeah listening listening to what you guys all say I totally align with you I do find that we use a lot of times the excuse that I'm being held back by the men mm. the reality is the men don't know what to do with us Mm -hmm. Because if you have a strong woman, they're usually afraid of her, yeah. right? They label her with a not so nice name. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, is there's nothing wrong with being a strong woman. I find that being straight about your communication, say what there is to say and don't beat around the bush. Don't try to soft, soften the blow. Don't try to be nice about it. Nice is an underlying um problem you know we think we have to be nice to deliver a message the reality we just need to say what there is to say yeah and we we kind of bypass that or think it's not necessary where the real danger is in any relationship in any of the uh generations or genders they're the stories we make up around it mm -hmm. so it could be built off of you know uh, something that happened to us in the past like i had a really bad boss so i think everybody's going to be and i am aware of somebody who behaves or walks like or talks like or sits like my boss mm -hmm. and i immediately go to a conclusion that they're like that boss when in reality i haven't even given them a chance mm -hmm. and in a nanosecond we are making these decisions it's part of the survival mechanism yeah. yeah, we go into survival mode in a lot of times on these, and we're we're not um, necessarily willing to sit back and go, "Whoa, it's us, it's not them." Mm -hmm. And I can tell you from my own experience, a lot of the mistakes I made, you know, a lot of the things I ran into, the walls that I I ran into, were ones that I actually put there, not that not the men. Mm -hmm. because I made up stories or thought it should be a certain way, or they reminded me of someone. You know, and going through the challenges that I went through, I found that I was probably causing at least, at least 80% of the problem for myself. Wow. My own mental, my own mental state, which is why what Jen has on the neuro linguistic programming, that is what made a difference for me, was shifting my own thinking and actually giving me the strength and the power yeah. to really yeah, own my yeah. position. Yeah. yeah. And that's emotional intelligence, which, you know, we talk about this all the time and leadership, how that is a predictor 
uh, for performance and success, along with cultural intelligence. But uh, what you just talked about, Linda, that's, that is the, the, one of the main uh, characteristics of an effective leader. And from the research, uh, I've had both ways. I've had people tell me, well, the research showed that women are emotionally uh, more emotionally intelligent and have higher emotional intelligence competencies than men. And then you see other research that doesn't necessarily show that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so I I agree about. And in fact, there's some research that shows when it comes to uh, that self-control piece of the emotions, women and men tend to be equal. So we all have that capability of not reacting and responding as opposed to reacting to things, regardless of our gender. Uh, it's not necessarily something that is rooted in biology, but there's some biological uh, reasons that you know, in the, in the structure of the brain, uh, because we are more attuned to emotions uh, uh, and what that are exhibited and non-verbals that are exhibited mm -hmm. uh, as, uh, you know, in the female brain. But also there's uh, mm -hmm. evidence that if a transgender person's brain mirrors the brain of the gender that they identify with. So that's how much biology is, is informing us also about these things, um, that we are in a way, uh, what people are perceiving as we're collaborative, we're trying to solicit several ideas because we have that ability through our brain to shift from the left to the right uh, in the moment, gathering different perspectives. Mm. Now it's being uh, perceived by those men who, who would want that and those women who would want that as well as being indecisive. In fact, a lot of times we see women uh, feeding back into these things towards other women. So I'm, I'm grateful to hear that, you know, we're here in a circle uh, candidly talking about uh, the danger and how we are presenting ourselves. And if we don't take ownership for our own behaviors and some of the words that we're using and how to really appeal to everybody's decision-making style and communication style, regardless of who's in front of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that um, one of the biggest things that I, based on my research, looking at the studies that say that um, it's 98% of a specific pool of people that they tested, 98% of the people and the brains that they tested, they, they did both sides. So that's why the gender didn't matter in those studies. So it was 98% had the ability to, to use both. And I think that what happens is we don't consider the upbringing by gender so and generationally. So when you think about men, when I was growing up, it, um, you know, it was very common for people to tell little boys, oh, you're a sissy lala, which is basically calling them a woman's female part, right? Mm -hmm. And indicating that they're being a girl. And so men like that in my generation, when you're in the workplace with them, they are not going to back down. They are not going to show vulnerability. It has been beaten into their heads that they can't. They cannot show weakness. They cannot show that they are emotionally in tune. But I bet you, I bet, I'm willing to bet, because, you know, I'm a poker player, that down the line, as they, as our kids today get older, because we are being more in tune and letting boys express their emotions, feel their big feelings, release them and move on, I'm willing to bet that in 20 years, it's not going to be like that. Right. And yeah. I think it's our responsibility yeah. to make sure that little boys know that they can experience emotions. They're human too. So I, I question whether or not upbringing has suppressed a man's ability to express himself and communicate because he's been told his whole life, you mm -hmm. need to you need to toughen up. You need to man up. Yeah. And no, I, I, I totally, I can see that myself in my, yeah. in my office, I have, I have 19 year old young men and I have 50 year old men. And when I look across the grain at the differences between them, I do have to approach them differently on how I motivate them because of that very thing of how they've been raised. But what I've noticed about the younger generations is that they don't have the same barriers that, that I had because there definitely was a difference to where I would even be heard. It's like a female, the pitch of a female's voice couldn't even be hear, heard by the men. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I would ally with men who would actually share what, my, what I wanted done and they would be heard. Yeah. Now, the bad part is they would get the credit, yeah. which 
you know, which again, you know, Patty knows this for a fact that I would give it up because it was what was in the best interest of my departments, yeah. my company, and making sure that we all won the game. But I paid the price of not being recognized for any brilliant idea I may have had. I had the same thing, Linda. I, I completely relate to that. And it's just a matter of building a power coalition and being the in the back seat and it doesn't matter who gets the credit yeah, to me. I don't yeah, because I don't care either. Yeah. You know, I just I had an objective and a goal that I wanted to get done. Yeah. But I think it's interesting that that so much data shows that from a physio physiological standpoint, there's no difference in the brains and so forth, but definitely uh, in the way that, that people have been raised or uh, the culture of a company or so, you know, I'm, I'm up in um, Silicon Valley area, you know, um, Sacramento is, is a world apart from San Francisco, but you know, a lot of the people I work with are in San Francisco, San Jose, you know, that particular area. Mm -hmm. And, man, the bad behavior, bad, bad behavior among young men who should know better, who have had, you know, gender training, or uh, you would think a more enlightened type of, um, of educational process or whatever. And, and they're just, you know, it, it seems like the, um, the good old boy club is alive and well in Silicon Valley, you know, and, and, uh, and having to have Uber programs, Uber, <laughs> that was a slip of the tongue, talk about a, you know, good old boy place, Uber, <laughs> but they have to have lots and lots of programs around trying to curb bad behavior, you know, and so there's, there's gotta be, we have a long, a long way to go, mm. but you know, you would, you would think that in such a liberal and enlightened area, you know, that, that it would be easier. I don't yeah. I think that, oh, go ahead, Samara. No, no, Sorry. you go, Jennifer. It's okay. I, I think that um, one of the things that I've noticed is that when you talk about the bad behavior, Patty, mm -hmm. I think immediately about harassment, sexual harassment, mm -hmm. and obviously it goes either way, right? The whole me too. I mean, it goes either mm -hmm. way. And I know that there's a lot of men out there that are a little bit scared and skittish because of the Me Too thing. And, and, and I don't think, I think a general application saying that it's, that all of the men are doing it is not what we're trying to say. But I will say that there is a general, in my experience, there has been a general practice that when we do sexual harassment training and we're all in there, it's like awkward party of 45, your table's ready. Right. And we're all sitting there like, this is really awkward. Everybody's making jokes. It's not really taken seriously. So I've always been a, an advocate that we need to change that type of training. It can't be that funny, like, oh, you're in the hardware department and they're making jokes about her because that's just supporting the humor. Like humor is a universal language. Mm -hmm. So when we're all laughing about it and it's, it's positioned that way because they don't want to make it uncomfortable, but at the same time, making it humorous, I think is sending the message that it's funny. So when we leave, we can go joke mm -hmm. about it. And, and it's not, it's not taken seriously. So I've always wanted to see something change in that frame of and, my HR. And the question on that is why, uh, you know, when we're seeking acceptance, usually that this behavior is basically what's been endorsed, what's been okay. And so that's the system that I'm talking about. So, so like you said, I, and I'm, am, you know, hoping in the future also for the same thing. If we are, we already know that the brain kind of forms in the way we train it. If we change these trainings, starting with little kids uh, about even the concept of gender and, and, and who's allowed to express emotions. I talk to men all the time uh, who are right now more than ever nervous, and this is interfering with mentoring women. Uh, taking women out to dinners or lunches or whatever things and yet we are sitting there and saying you need to be an inclusive leader you need to be uh, you know emotionally intelligent culturally intelligent get to know people build a rapport with your uh, direct uh, reports uh, do all of this but yet we're we're saying all of these confusing things on the side where if they don't uh. have that they're going to be perceived as a bad person uh, mm -hmm. because they want that because not everybody is, is, is speaking about this from the perspective, from lack of judgment. There's so much judgment around this issue uh, and, uh, and a blame language. Mm. And, uh, and then the, this pressure to fit in uh, 
But then the question to me is always, who said to us that, that this is how you belong? We need to change the rules about what makes you belong to begin with. Uh, how we look at, uh, you know, endorsement is not like who do we promote uh, and who do we advance. It's also who do you pick to, to be uh, going with you to this function? Who do you talk to? Who are you making eye contact with in the meeting? Who's occupying the airtime in the meeting? Goes back to why you didn't get credit to begin with. Because uh -huh. it was endorsed, that, that competitive behavior. So what a leader used to be, that kind of uh, leadership style of being highly directive, uh, maybe uh, you know delegating, telling people what they're supposed, very clear instructions, just go do it, do the task. Mm -hmm. That was a long time ago, the preferred leadership style, not just in, in other countries, but in the US. And we've shifted now and we're saying we want participative leaders, more inclusive leaders. What that would mean is, is an understanding of belonging more than just the vision and inclusion belonging means that uh, you don't have to make these jokes for me to be right. your buddy at work or invite you or include you in other things yeah and if i do see you doing them i know enough to make you feel that you belong by addressing them with you without making you lose face and embarrassing you and uh because i know deep down in your heart you know better yeah, that's, and a, that's a really good point because you're you're talking about that's that that idea of belonging is a step beyond mm -hmm. inclusion. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like diversity, inclusion, and then belonging, which kind of speaks more to the the culture, right, of the company. Would you say, Samara? I, I yeah. Uh, so one thing that uh, part of the work that I do is always, you know, we work kind of we say, what do you want to be as an organization? We work back and what needs to be in place, mm -hmm. uh, what are the things that have to be basically true, functioning, and effective mm -hmm. in order for us to reach this desired outcome. And you never hear a corporation say, oh, we just want to be the, the good old boys club and just you know, have some fun at work and picking at people and all that. They will say we want to be a fun environment, but not at the expense of marginalizing a group and all that. So when we work backwards to see what, what's not there, and tweaking it as we go along to make yeah. it effective. One of the things is that feeling that people have that there are only one or two things, two, three, you know, specific list of things that I have to do in order for everybody in my team to make me feel like I belong. Mm -hmm. And even though sometimes that goes against who I am, oh, in the spirit of being adaptable, here I am doing that. When leadership and teaching somebody to be inclusive uh, should not be about changing who you are. It's about the, 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 in the core, your message, your thinking, your beliefs need to remain the same. It's just how you share with the other person what you believe in your heart, meaning, you know, that's great that you're in the hardware, uh, you know, right now that instead of making a joke about it, that, that's great. And, and I, I think that's, you know, it's just we don't we don't allow people to feel like they can adapt but still say i am who i am and that's where we draw the line and it's okay but i'm gonna share with you in a way that you can receive it why i believe the way i believe and yeah. so women end up feeling you know that the endorsed uh leadership needs to be perhaps more emotionally restrained uh you know let me make the decision because then i look decisive when here we are trying to actually train everybody to inclusive of various perspectives go and ask others you know find out uh, how people are perceiving you do 360 all of that stuff and and then when you look at women and men in power uh when what i mean by that and is in positions of power it's interesting because some of the behaviors that we associate with men we see that it is really about power dynamics so it becomes about uh who's really got that power in the moment and who has the advantage. And now you start seeing some people marginalizing uh, others that maybe at that time they were in that same role and they were being marginalized. Yeah. 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 That's to me very interesting to see down the road if we are uh, talking right now, really is it a men woman thing or is it who's in power thing? Because I working with domestic violence survivors and with people who have been uh, survivors of sexual trauma, 
it is not, it is, we, we see more women statistically, but when you look at the dynamics, when women are the instigators and the aggressors, it's when the power dynamics have shifted and then they feel that they can do that. And so we, are, we don't want to necessarily always be playing victim either. Yeah, not at all, not at all. And I think that there's a lot to that too. The, I think the victim mentality will just feed it, um, but exactly what you said about it's who's in power, mm -hmm. the one that's in power sets the tone. And yeah. so, you know, you might see that different in each business or each organization that, um, there, there might be a leader that is very inclusive and does a very good job of managing diversity. Um, I'm a big proponent of diversity in thought. I, mm -hmm. I feel like yeah. if, if all of us are thinking the same way, we're not really going to get anywhere. But if we have people who will tell me what I need to hear, I might not want to hear it right now, but I need to hear it in order to either grow, make a decision, or make an improvement, then that's the diversity in thought that, that is needed. And sometimes you whoever's in power might want everybody to acclimate to their method and their thought process. And you know, if, if, they're, if there's pushback, that's when you start seeing a lot of problems. Mm. And I've seen a lot of my clients will leave because of that. They leave because of who's in yeah. power and who they allow yeah. to behave the wrong way. And to me, it's just that's ineffective leadership. And that person, it's well, yeah, it's when they, when they tolerate it, right? That level of tolerance of putting up with things like that that should have been corrected early on that could have been a very minor minor correction now becomes something much bigger that can really damage a company or organization yeah because you tolerance know, is it, it signals acceptance yes right yeah it's a it's like the unspoken right mm -hmm. so there's the the real culture you know that the employees live and then there's the stated culture that management thinks is there Right. And there's, there's in most organizations, not all, but there's a gap. Now, in historically, we would say, we would draw a conclusion, right? Because historically, companies have been managed by men. We would say it's a man problem. It's a, the male species does this. When in reality, it has nothing to do with it. It really is about the power, what's accepted behavior, you know, and alignment to the, the really core values and a lot of companies don't really know what their core values are mm -hmm. they have yeah. them on the wall but they don't live them then they're not core values right and so, so what's going to happen what happens in those situations too is each leader has their own set of core values that might be different or disproportionate to what the company is trying to drive and they their ego ego is why we have these yeah. communication yeah. issues yeah. in my opinion i don't think it has anything to do with gender it's all ego driven I and, agree with that. Hang on a minute. I mean, I do think there are some gender gaps in the way that we communicate. Um, and maybe it's not, and I'm going to be, I'm going to do some sweeping generalities. So Samara, you're, I, I, I'm <laughs> glad that you're good. Cringe. With your, Get ready to cringe. <laughs> yeah, but, but um, you know, it's like, uh, it's like just in the way that we talk about things. Linda, you mentioned about, we want to be liked, you know, there's uh -huh. this real likability bias, you know, I mean, like, does, when do we talk about, um, uh, well, I don't know that she can be, you know, a, a manager because she's really not very likable or we tailor the way we're going to respond in a situation because we want to be liked. And how often does a woman say something like, well, I feel like we should do X, Y, Z men don't necessarily say that very often. They don't use the word I feel. They may just state what it is that they, that they want to say. So exactly I, right. I do think that there is, there are some generalities in the differences in the way the genders communicate. So, so I would, I would relate that back to language mm -hmm. and I will, I will own the fact that I at times use weak language. Yeah. You know, and I have to be responsible. But again, that's not a man problem. That's a being problem. It's a female problem for me. And not everybody may share the same thing. But I probably apologize way too much. Yes. I, you know, I overthink things, don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. So I overthink it instead of just taking the stand or the action that I need to. But those are, that's me as an individual. I won't even say that it's a woman trait. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. Will, and I, I, I'll go along with somebody said culturally, 
you know, and environmentally, we've grown up this way. And yes, I have because my age. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now the next generations coming up don't have that problem. In fact, I've, I actually talked with my millennials and they don't see a problem they, between the male and female, everybody looks, looks the same to them. So they don't get what we're talking about. When I asked my millennial followers, they said, what is mansplaining? Yeah. I, I literally, I will, I, will, I will die. I will go to my grave saying that this is not a gender thing at all. It is a specific baggage issue from when you were growing up. If you use weak language, if you get offended, if you get triggered by whoever, because I'm going to tell you, there are men that do it and there are women that do it, period. Mm -hmm. it, it just, it, it, it's a generational how you were raised and baggage triggers you based on that. So whatever happened to you in the past when somebody was saying those things to you, or if you're using weak language or you tend to apologize a lot, which parent were you seeking validation from when you were growing up? Hmm. Seriously. Right, right. For me, it was my father, right? Right. So, and so for some people, it's their mother. Whatever parent it was that you were seeking validation from, it, it usually shapes how you communicate mm -hmm. and whether or not you struggle with it. So for me, I, I absolutely wholeheartedly, I do not buy into it's a gender issue at yeah. all. It's a baggage, how I grew up and how I interpret the world and whether or not I can respond in a certain way. Um, it doesn't have in, it doesn't have anything to do with whether or not you're a man or a woman. I'll tell you, I literally because th this is th this should tell it this, this in and of itself. My story growing up, I was constantly told that I, I wasn't enough in indirect ways, mm -hmm. and until I released all of my baggage, I had a chip on my shoulder. I was that assertive female that people would be like, "Ooh, and you bruise the male ego." Yeah, I probably do, but you know, it has nothing to do with me being a woman. Why do why? This is just how I speak. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was, I had something to prove. So women who have something to prove mm -hmm. tend to be the one that has the chip on their shoulder. They're more assertive and they're going to get further influencing or communicating with men. And they're also going to make them angry if they have an ego, but they're also going to make other women that are strong, angry too. It, it's not a matter of whether or not it's a man or a woman. It's if it's somebody's ego and you are bruising it, they're going to respond in a way that is not going to be conducive to what you're expecting. And then that might trigger you and take it personally. And then it can send you in terminal velocity in terms of your effectiveness on how you respond. But I wholeheartedly, I believe that it's, it has nothing to do with gender at all. Right. Sorry, my children are running up and down and screaming. So, <laughs> and I, and I talked to the, all the, my millennial clients that I, that clientele, when I said, Hey, I'm doing this today. I, my Facebook, if you go to my Facebook page, the very first person that responded on my Facebook page, her name is Taylor Douglas. She's in the millennial generation and she said, what is mansplaining? And as I continued to speak to other people, anybody that was in that range of being born in the eighties was like, what are you talking about? And so they don't even understand that it's an issue because they don't, they don't speak like that. They don't have those gender gaps or see it that way. They see it in terms of, I'm just trying to communicate and get things done and I can't get through to this person. So I'm going to try this. And it's either a man or a woman that they can't, that they're struggling with. But my, my clients that are in my range, like in the 45 range and higher, they're very much, oh, I can't get this done. It's like, it's a man's world and I'm just a squirrel trying to get a nut. And I'm trying, those are the ones that I'm helping the most because they're, they're the ones that need to remove the most blocks. Yeah, so one way to think about this uh, that I've done is um, when, when we're saying men, uh, we are associating it with characteristics and features. So oftentimes we're associating it with, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you know, uh, people who need, want efficiency, problem solving really fast, very action oriented, uh, don't show too much emotion. So if we take out that label, we started with that actually this conversation, we were talking about the, the impact of labor. We take out the label and we say, uh, this is a world where I am in, this culture that I'm in, that endorses this, 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 and they're expecting me to be this way, but I, not that way. That is not how my brain works. My diversity of thought is not there. That is not, those are not my values, my communication continuums, none of that. What can I do, for example, to speak with somebody? So even if we call it any kind of explaining, it doesn't have to be mansplaining, because there's also oh, over, over explaining, over explaining, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, exactly. It's basically the idea of underlying all of this is somebody who did not think that you did a good enough job 
saying what you did, but that they could do a better job than you doing it. That's really and underlying. Disrespect. And that could be, yeah, it's the it's disrespect, but it's not only a gender issue because there's another word, I don't know if anybody's familiar with it, that's been surfacing, <laughs> but it's white explaining. Uh, and it's another it's what? Word. White explaining meaning like white person explaining. So the idea is, if you're somebody who's not necessarily in power uh, in in terms of the room and the hierarchy and job function and all that, and there's this other person that has the clout, that has the power, and here they are, but despite having all of it, they're feeling like they have to hush you or explain it better than you or dismiss you or take credit for it or not even allow you to speak. That's really the, the underlying concept. That's what we're talking about. So now then the issue becomes, what do we do uh, when that situation presents itself? And I leverage what I believe is, uh, maybe it's my culture, maybe because, uh, you know, and I do, did grow up in a very collectivistic culture. So naturally I am collectivistic. Uh, cooperation is important, but also competition was important from a family perspective. So you want your family to rise and sign in the world and your team to rise so very much competitive uh, but also at the same time collectivistic so i do use this to my advantage uh, maybe also because i'm trained in parliamentary debate so somebody i feel is explaining over me i let them go because as you said it is the ego and sometimes people whose ego gets bruised easily it's coming from a place of insecurity so I say things like, oh, well, that's great that you're building on what I just said. Tell me more about that. And inevitably, like after the second sentence, there isn't much even depth to it because they were totally like just, um, they didn't have the depth of knowledge or the expertise. They just wanted uh -huh. that kind of person who wanted to take credit, look smart, but very superficial. More, majority of call those that's the what pile, pile on people. Yeah. And so I let them go. And then the room itself just witnessed the dynamics. So then I say, okay, so I turn it back to the room and I say, all right, so we started with this idea that I was saying, looks like blah, 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 uh, their name uh, started building on it because it's been sometimes women as well. So what, what does everybody think about where we should be heading next in terms of this? That's my perspective on where we are, one, two, three, and I go back and take it and own it. You know what I like about that, Samara, is that you, you just explained exactly what I think is the resolution, and that's you asked open-ended questions uh -huh. and you said involvement. And that's right. key. Yeah. Asking the open-ended questions. Everyone question. else now is going to be my ally. I don't yeah. have to say, oh my goodness, you just mansplained, you just white explained, you just did this. I don't have to name it, label it, or anything. I just uh, shifted the dynamics and created a space where they became, uh, they, they just perceived me as the credible person. I owned it back again. Well, and the fact is, is that it's okay that people have different uh, views and opinions, exactly. you know? So if somebody, it, for them, it's a comfort to mansplain, then fine. It's not going to hurt me that they're doing it. They're, it's like, I should take that yeah. seriously. Yeah. I should get upset. Why should I turn it into something that's an adversarial relationship or conversation? Yeah. Don't have to. <laughs> You're so brilliant and smart of just letting them, letting them go you know, and then bringing it back around again, because it actually shows the power of communication. And I, yes, and I think it's that bringing it back around again, you know, like yeah. I, um, I had a coach one time that, that shared with me, don't respond to everything that's, that is said in terms of like reacting or, um, or overreacting or, or so forth. But, you know, her, her counsel was just say, that's very interesting. What is it that makes you think X? And then just like Samara said, as they, there isn't any more there, there, you know, so you've now just without being aggressive or combative, you have kind of exposed it to the room and brought it back down to here's what we're, we're actually talking about. So there's, I think, I mean, it's interesting, but you, you guys are all circling around this idea of power and, and holding on to your power in the way that you choose yeah. to respond to some of these. Right. There, there is negative stuff that happens in the workplace, but how do we retain our credibility and our power and our, um, uh, I don't want to say, um, how do you look, how do you just look, come out looking classy and smart and, and, you know, 
the best. But, well, you know, the key, the key, Patty, is really about being willing to be responsible. Mm -hmm. If you're willing to be responsible, it doesn't mean in a moral sense it's good, bad, right, or wrong. It just means if I'm being responsible, I then have power and I can take action because it's within my control. I choose mm -hmm. to be responsible. I can actually do something about mm -hmm. it yeah. rather than letting it be done to me. Yeah. And I'm not only responsible for me, I'm sometimes responsible for those others around me. Yes. Not because they don't have the voices, they have the voices. It's because eventually what happens with work, and just like you're saying, Patty, bad things do happen. Mm -hmm. And so, so while I can turn a conversation back around in a room and do that because I've reflected on this, that's my job, that's what I do, that's how I train, others may not be able to. So part of the work that I do is how do we teach others around to do this for those that have been marginalized because there's been a pattern. So the, the, the issue becomes mm. these things, they're not isolated incidents. That's where we start thinking men, 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 women, 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 you know, millennials, millennials, uh, this generation, whatever. It's because we start seeing patterns and then we overlap mm. the other identities to the pattern. Mm -hmm. So how right. can we all, in response, in power comes responsibility, like you said, uh, Linda, basically, but I'm not, I don't feel that my responsibility is just to myself. I feel yeah. that yeah. that's is, brilliant. What do you yeah. do when you see yeah. and now, even if I don't necessarily believe it's a gender issue and my friend who is a woman, I'm watching her and she is taking everything through the gender lens and isolating everything else. How can I also be there for her right. To, uh, right. to have that identity protected that she cares for? as well right whatever it right. is so yeah. yeah that is the hardest part of i think uh this is uh, speaking up when you don't necessarily feel you're in a position without getting some consequences against mm -hmm. you um you know so, so you, you kind of do you have access to that power all the time not really i mean i've been mm -hmm. in meetings where i've known also to keep my mouth shut and mm -hmm. handle other things in mm -hmm. other ways uh, and, but it's not that I let it go. It's that I just knew that, that wasn't the right timing. Right. There's different yeah. ways of deal. There's different ways of dealing with those types yeah. of situations that are a little bit more global. But yeah. if you think of, if everybody was responsible for their own words and actions, then there'd be less yeah. of the global issues. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's part of the training that has to be done and people to accept that. Um, you know, earlier we had talked about the concept about belonging, and I think that companies, in order for them to be successful, have got to have, especially in a market where it's going to be a shortage of resources, human resources, they've got to retain, and that sense of belonging is going to be very key. Being heard is going to be a major change in a lot of organizations. You know, being accepted is going to be a change. Uh, working together and having that collaboration together is going to make a difference for organizations and their success. But one of the key things that I find that if a company can take on and help their employees build a memory together, a memory together, and it can be something so small, like Patty shared at the beginning of the Xena doll, <laughs> you know, and it may not have been on the recording, Patty, so you may need to say something about it again, but that Xena doll, she and I instantly can connect and know exactly what was going on at the time. And, that and was it's 20 a long years ago. It was 20 years ago, and that doll still has that same impact. So if we can get people together to actually create that memory, there's power there that companies can leverage, that employees can use, that managers can use. And that's a great, that's a great thing that the Xena doll, because it's, it's an item that has a story attached to it. And the emotion is something like it's a universal emotion that it, it means something to you guys, but also the story that you tell to us, it conveys a message that's very powerful, you know? So I thought that that was cool when we first got on and I learned about the Xena doll. Yeah. Yeah. Samara, do you think that when you mentioned that sometimes in the meetings, you'll just be quiet, is that, um, I have a lot of people that ask when is it appropriate to just pick battles? Like, when do I pick my battles? Is that something that you think is important to do? And um, when is it, have you ever seen a situation where people are um, 
find, getting up against that line where it's like, am I picking my battle or am I just withdrawing? I yeah, have a lot of people so, that ask so that question. One thing that I keep in mind, and just because I do a lot of work in cultural intelligence and keeping in mind that um, we, just because you're sitting in a room with a bunch of people doesn't mean everybody really has equal voice. Uh, because if you're in a highly hierarchical organization or it's a culture like that, uh, speaking up and saying something against that uh, leader or, or whoever's running the show in the moment, it's actually going to backfire on you and people won't be your allies. They'll feel that the best thing for them to do is to kind of go against you, even though they might believe what you're believing because they don't want the consequences from that leader and they understand you just made the leader lose face as well so that's where i'm very mindful uh, and a big part of this is doing your research with who you're in front of i already know that some people uh, they are just all about giving them the acknowledgement for their achievement right there off the bat feeding into what they feel that they have contributed and value that disarms them and in that moment, you're more likely, if I do want to then say something, I'm more likely to be listened to. Mm -hmm. But if I'm coming in, reacting, I haven't shown them that I do appreciate them to begin with, then they're going to they're gonna react to that. If I've already built enough rapport for that, whatever comes out of my mouth is going to be looking like it's coming from a place of love, you know, mm -hmm. from right. Right. and, yeah, and right. you're not judging me. And right. there's a way. So I, I, I'm not going to lie and say, oh, yes, most of the time I'm silent, obviously. If you're looking at me now, you can tell. But <laughs> it's just that I, I know enough now and maybe from my upbringing about how to still show the respect for somebody through your silence in that moment, but still be able to reach them through others or on your own later on. And it's amazing the transformation that you see later in the next meeting how they are seeking you to say something while at first they may have reacted. So I've learned over time, just, um, you know, experience, I guess, but I, I still have many, many, many more years. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, uh, that concept of, is this a hill I want to die on? Is, is that <laughs> It's mean, great. It, it is. It's really important to get. And so like I, in the in the courses that I teach, um, I, I teach the American Management Association. And so there's always in the open forums. There's you know I've got people that are in their 60s all the way down to millennials. You know, and and people will just be like, no, this is just right. This is this is you know it, it it's a woman thing or oh it's they think I'm too young or oh it's you know, whatever the case may be, and and trying to get people to understand, is this truly the hill you want to die on? Or do you want to, you know, live to I love that, day, you know, and, yeah. and that is, a um, if we get, you know, I, I'm just really surprised at where this conversation went tonight, because, and I love that, I love when you start, you know, talking this stuff up, because if we do say it's all about gender difference, or it's all about generational difference, or it's all about age difference, or it's all about industry difference, or what have you, then that's the lens we're seeing it through. Mm -hmm. And when you disrespect me or, or don't give me space, that's how I'm going to see it. And then, you know, every hill's worth dying on. Well, then good luck with that. That's all <laughs> a very short career. <laughs> yeah. And I think the reason why it, it means a lot to me is I hate to see people give away their power like that. And, mm. and it just, it, it, when I say that it's just this problem or it's my age or it's that, because I was there, you know, I used to be the 19 year old who I had that victim mentality of I'm never going to do anything or get along because they're, I'm so much younger than them. And, mm -hmm. and it took a while for a mentor just kind of slap me in the face and say, you need to wake up and take your power back. Why do you keep saying you can't do these things? And <laughs> Until that happened, I did. I felt very defeated on a regular basis. Yeah. And so I just, I, I really don't want anyone to have to, to go through that. I know that, you know, I learned it the hard way and that's probably why it stuck and it stung. But I feel like when I used to blame it on that, I gave my power to that person. And I want to, I want to keep my power to decide, you know, life is, it's 10% what happens to me, 90% how I respond is, is how I tried to reframe it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is why you get to choose, right? I like the word choice better than decide, 
Yeah. And yeah. the reason is, is because everything that ends in sight is usually death, pesticide, suicide, <laughs> you know. So decide is, is the death of possibilities. Yeah. So I like choosing. I get to choose which, which option I'm going to do. Yeah. So language is everything. It is. That is. <laughs> You know, this has been just a really great time. I mean, I, I love these forums. I love the conversations. I love bringing people together. Um, so as we wrap up our time together, who, any last words that, that you want to, you know, leave? This is recorded forever and ever and ever. I, I do. I want to leave. I want to leave one thing because it, I think, made the biggest difference for me in my leadership and uh, I think for the teams that I led was there was a power in laughter. Yeah. And I think of Monsters, Inc. It's one of my favorite things where they finally figure out that laughing gives so much more power than the brutal, heavy hand, mm -hmm. angry, scare them tactics. Yeah. And I think for managers, so laughter to me is very important and it can anchor that memory nice. if you have something where you can laugh at. Yes. Awesome. I think the power of the stories, you know, the items like even the Xena doll talking about the stories and really just trying to identify how can you connect on an emotional level. It, it brings up a whole new level of communication because you're in a rapport and you're feeling the same way. Yeah. And it, it's, it's that memory thing. Um, yeah, the open ended questions. And I liked what Samara had said about speaking last. It's mm -hmm. something that's it's yeah. very powerful to do. Speaking last. Yeah. 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 Samara, bring us home. <laughs> I wanted to say, uh, as I, I love how this conversation went because we did talk about differences, but what's interesting is all the things that we ended up finding in common, uh, mm -hmm. you know, on, on the gender <laughs> piece, but also just among us. Yeah. And if you look at the images of all of us, physically at least, we all look different, where we speak differently, and then right. I'm sure all our experiences and thoughts are likely different but there was so much in common in terms of we're we're all seeking to work with one another mm -hmm. uh more effectively and have that feeling of acceptance and not anybody being marginalized trumped uh in any ways in their uh perspective mm -hmm. and i think we kind of illustrated it today so it's really nice uh and i don't know if that's a gender thing that just got <laughs> exhibited uh, because you know that is a stereotype but i found that, you know, the dynamics of this call kind of feed back into that same thing when we started <laughs> see humor yeah <laughs> that's a pleasure really that's awesome thank, thank you, you for the school Thank you Thank so you for much for the opportunity. This was yeah. this was a lot of fun, and um, and I look forward to the next time that we are are all together. And and uh, we have a comment here from Michelle Lagos who said thanks for hosting it. It was enlightening to to sit in on the the conversation. So uh, thanks to all of you who That's joined cool. us here today you, and looking out for the next time that we're all together in the ladies' room. Be sure. To <laughs> thanks, Patty. Take Bye. care. Thank you. Hi, ladies. Good meeting Bye. you all. It's nice meeting you. You too.